Welcome to First Class Fantasy. I'm Theo Greminger. Billy Muzio is not here today, and he's not taking off because he was depressed about the Jerry Judy news. He had he had something else to do. Um, but I'm thrilled to be joined by Sean Siegel. Uh, Sean Siegel um, is one of the owners at Rotoviz. Uh, Sean is very well known in the industry. Uh, he's on Stealing Bananas with Ben Gretsch. He produces a ton of content at Rotoviz on the written side as well as the podcasting side. Um, and he is synonymous with a very famous article about zero RB strategy. And I think this year with so many managers jumping into the zero RB streets and certainly a lot more in the hero RB streets or anchor RB, any way you want to cut it, wide receivers, are, wide receivers are going off the board and there's never been more enthusiasm at building your team around the position. And I thought it would be very important to get Sean right here on first class fantasy to talk sometime before we draft in the uh the big money drafts at the end of the month so sean welcome to first class fantasy how are you doing today good good i mean you you broke some news for me today i've been just in the cave working on the zero rb candidates countdown part one came out yesterday part two will actually come out i think while we are on the air here so that's kind of fun but yeah i mean preseason has been fun i feel like we're on the guys who are hitting, and yet you, know, you, you hate to see these players going down before the season's even started. It's a real reminder that the team that you draft through the first five or six rounds and you feel like are the starters that you're going to go with week one. I mean, hopefully they even make it to week one, but certainly by weeks four, five, six, I mean, you have to draft a strong overall team if you want to work your way through the chaos of the season. Yeah, it speaks to depth. It speaks to every pick mattering. Um, and it speaks to really kind of like the cruelty of, of fantasy football, when, especially when it's a player like Jerry Judy, who, you know, we've been bullish on uh, here at First Class Fantasy for the last six weeks. I've been asking so many people, are you taking Christian Watson or Jerry Judy in that fourth round? Because it's been like that was the big question. Are you going with which 23 year old wide receiver do you like? And there's been some different different answers. But most people have been extremely bullish on a Judy. You know, I'm not going to call it a breakout season because he broke out before, but a, you know, the best season of his career, the best opportunity. And then we have this sort of news. And again, we're not trying to speculate on injuries, but it definitely sounds like something that is not minor. I'm sure we'll know a lot more by, you know, tomorrow morning, but Sean, I'll, I'll ask you this with the, with the quick reaction, where will Marvin Mims start being selected? Cause I think Cortland Sutton, the market is going to correct um, based on the available targets. I think he's going to move up considerably. But Marvin Mims is a guy that we're extremely high on. I know Rotoviz has also been high on. Um, and now he has a potential huge opportunity to start the season. If you had to guess where his ADP ends up right out the gate, where would it be? I think there's still enough skepticism about how this Denver passing offense is going to work. And we even you know, now get some more little pieces in terms of Greg Dulcich. He's somebody who has been a riser, has been a faller. People are all over the place on him. Russell Wilson has looked better. And you think Sean Payton, this overall passing offense, I mean, yeah, I mean, you just think about how crazy it was that he came out and, uh, you know, like everybody said, just really went outside the bounds of, of sort of what's accepted and crushed the coaching from the previous year. And this offense is going to be good. Is it good enough to turn some of these guys who are more peripheral players into you know fantasy starters? One of the things when we were putting together the Road of His rookie guide all the way back in January is that you know Marvin Mims looked like a guy who was weirdly undervalued by you know sort of reality draft folks. And Colin Kelly and I, we host the Road of His Overtime podcast together, had a lot of draft experts on during draft season asking them like what's the story here with marvin mims why is he not higher i mean we're seeing him as potentially the second best wide receiver in this class he's obviously not going to go that high in the draft you know wh what are we missing and instead everybody just consistently came on and said no i mean this guy looks like he's going to be awesome and that's obviously what the broncos said as well when they picked him i think you're going to get a couple of round bump but mostly i think that people are going to play it in a different way in terms of how they just construct their team to that first six seven eight rounds one of the things that we're seeing right now as you alluded to is that drafters want to have their receiving position set by the time that you know 
wide receiver window slam shut. I don't know that Mims is going to be a guy who joins that group where you feel comfortable adding him into the mix, but certainly I like the shares that I have. You know, I have him in a main event already. I mean, that part of it looks better. But I mean, when you looked at Judy at that three, four turn and, you know, in best ball, if you're putting him with Keenan Allen, I mean, those things were so exciting. And I think it's easy to mix the fact that, and Judy actually had an interesting profile in the, his first three seasons in the NFL, three different strong arguments for the things that he did. The, the big problem was quarterback play and injuries. And now we have at least one and we still could have the other at some point later in the season. Yeah, it's tremendously unfortunate. Um, I'll say we took, I'm with uh, Andrew Geller, uh, AKA the guilds and Andrew Schellenberg splitting a slow main event. And we tilted and we took uh, Marvin Mims at the 1101. I think he's going to go higher than that. So I, I think that this is, uh, you know, we, we read it correctly. Um, but yeah, I, I th- it's amazing how these things sort of react. And, you know, we haven't even talked about the, the JSN uh, setback or the Terry McLaurin turf toe. So before we get started on, on zero RB strategy and diving into more of these wide receivers, there's one question that I've been asking pretty much every single guest on my podcast press coverage and then here at First Class Fantasy with Billy Muzio and I is, Sean, you guys put a lot of time into your projections, a lot of time into your rankings. If there was one player in all of fantasy that you could know the final stats for, who would it be? Is it a potential guy whose performance in a positive or negative way unlocks a teammate? Is it a guy who maybe has an incredibly wide range of outcomes? Of all the guys in fantasy, if you can know their final stats, let us know who it would be. Well, it would be Sam Howell, right? Okay. Howell is a guy that I thought should have gone in the top 10 picks last year. And instead, he plummets through the draft. And as a result, people are skeptical. And I think that generally speaking, you should have that skepticism about a quarterback who was drafted where he was drafted. And yet you look at what he did in college, you look at the arm, you look at the mobility, you look at how he profiles for fantasy if he stays as the starter, then you start to look at the weapon. So you'd want to know both for him, and this is a player that I have in virtually every Superflex Dynasty League, in virtually every Superflex best ball tournament. And so, I mean, whether he does well or not makes a huge difference for my teams personally, but I also think it's going to determine in a lot of ways what happens sort of for the season because one of the questions that we have to work through is how do you compete with the elite quarterbacks and window qb has really always been the way to play again especially in best ball what you look at in redraft when those window qbs are really pushed down then that's also a very strong consideration because i mean you essentially get an additional high leverage pick and very little penalty when you push those guys down in redraft leagues But if you're able to compete with a guy who really is coming out of the back or in some cases is completely undrafted, then I mean it changes the overall landscape of what types of teams are going to be league winners and what types of teams are going to be tournament winners. But then the other thing, too, is you just have guys like Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson. You've got a couple of running backs where, I mean, if he hits, then those guys are going to outperform as well. I love the answer, Sean, and you're you're the first person I've asked on, on either show, and I've asked a lot of them, and a lot of sharp people that you know, and this is easily the first time I've heard Sam Howell, a lot of people with Deshaun Watson, a lot of people with Anthony Richardson, but yeah, if you can get that sort of value late and, and be able to completely punt a quarterback, and then in those super flex, especially super flex best ball, uh, to be able to get that sort of production, um, it's very, very exciting. And I also think on the underdog side, a lot of those three quarterback builds, if you end up with Howell hitting as like quarterback 11, quarterback 12, and you've pushed quarterback down to the end, you could end up having a a powerhouse team that could really compete in those money weeks at the end. We're going to dive into a number of players here, Sean. We're going to dive into a bunch of these wide receivers, a bunch of ways we can use zero RB strategy, um, and some of Sean's favorite players to target, and some of Sean's favorite players to fade after we hear from our sponsors. Hey, we're all starting new fantasy leagues all the time. And more often than not, where do we start our fantasy leagues at Player Profiler? On Sleeper. Because it's the best. You can imagine my excitement when I saw Sleeper rolled out. Sleeper picks, baby. Now, you know I love Kenny Pickett, right? Week one, who does he face? 
San Francisco. That's a bummer. So I'm going to be going less than on Kenny Pickett's projected yardage and on whichever quarterback is starting for San Francisco in week one. (laughs) Probably not Trey Lance. (laughs) But then who do the Steelers face in week two? Ah, the Browns, right? We think the Browns are going to crank things up. So there you can say, hey, Kenny Pickett, more than his projected passing yards. And you keep on correlating. Elijah Moore, more than. George Pickens, more than. And if you pick up to eight, that's how you 100x your payout on Sleeper. It's called the Hail Mary. So if you use promo code UNDERWORLD, you get a $100 instant deposit match. Check out Sleeper's terms and conditions for details. These Sleeper picks are live in over 25 states. Yeah, buddy. Welcome back to First Last Fantasy. I'm Theo Greminger here with Sean Siegel of Rotoviz. Sean, we're in one dynasty league against one another. We're in the Black Crown League, um, which is run by Curtis Patrick, your partner at Rotoviz, and also my guest tomorrow on press coverage. And this was uh, not intentional to have back to back Rotoviz guys. I love it. You guys are both sharp, really, really sharp guys. But I scheduled with Sean months ago, and Curtis was a recent schedule. So this, this just sort of happened, but it's very cool. But Sean, I want one dynasty question for you. And I think that. Sometimes on my dynasty shows here, I'll talk redraft and some of the dynasty heavy consumers on like Sonic Truth will say, tell Theo to stop talking about redraft. And sometimes on the redraft shows, when I bring up dynasty, you have some of these redraft people just say, Theo, you know, let's chill out. It's August. We don't want to hear about dynasty. It's redraft season. But I think these all really tie together, especially when we're looking at breakout talents and the sort of players that are going to beat ADP. There's a big cyclical nature to this game. And I think Dynasty and Redraft go hand in hand. So my question to you, Sean, is twofold. Who is the wide receiver three in Dynasty? It's almost universal that Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase are wide receiver one and wide receiver two. And in most non-superflex leagues, those guys are the two off the board. So who is your wide receiver three? And the follow-up question is, a year from now, if we're sitting here and there is a big three or perhaps one player has broken in and caused a new big two, who would that player be? And this could be two answers. Yeah, I I have Garrett Wilson as the wide receiver three. His performance last season, when you consider just how disastrously bad the Jets quarterback play was, it's, it's hard to look at that and think anything other than once he gets competent QB play. And we have to consider that, I mean, Aaron Rodgers was not, fantastic last year and so you do have a little bit of risk for this season which obviously is going to impact your dynasty value but then as they have to make that eventual move to someone else so you have some risks there with wilson and at the same time i mean he's the guy where if you expected or you envision someone at the end of the year elevating into that group both in terms of just what he's done from a production perspective and then stylistically you know, how he looks and feels out there. And and you compare that to what you get from Jefferson, what you get from Chase and why they're so dynamic, why you would expect them to consider to continue to put up big points because the variety within what they bring and that talent level, the speed, all of those things so elite that, you know, even if some areas of the offense break down or some pathways close i mean they're going to continue to put up points we already saw that with wilson who as a rookie was able able to overcome zach wilson so he's going to be the guy but there are other names in the mix it's one of the reasons why in superflex startups that second round is fairly enticing cd lamb probably a little bit less of a chance to elevate but certainly a better floor the best floor of any of those guys amon Ra. i mean jalen waddle somebody who is so electric that if the sort of targets per route element closes at all between him and Tyreek Hill, you're starting to look at a guy who is going to elevate into that range. Certainly Chris Olave. And then the guy that I have ranked, I think at 204 right now, and as someone that I've drafted massive numbers of in redraft, and now (laughs) I'm trying to decide how much more I want to add. I mean, Jackson Smith and Jigba could, I mean, you're not going to have a rookie season like Jefferson or Chase, But, I mean, he is very much there, even with the injury, in a situation where he can put Metcalf 
and lock it behind him almost right away. If he does that, then, I mean, he's going to be in that potential range where he could be a first-round startup pick next year. And first-round startup in Superflex. So a guy who could punch in there, join those two receivers, get into that mix with the QBs. I love the answer. Garrett Wilson has been my answer to this. And I think even if you don't think that Garrett Wilson is the current dynasty wide receiver three, I think Garrett Wilson is the archetype for the kind of guy that could break into this big two. The elite talent, the draft capital, the early breakout at Ohio State, the early production in the NFL, and the fact that he was somewhat quarterback proof. Sean, does his year two remind you a little bit of Odell Beckham heading into year two? where the market was really, really high on him, but maybe underestimating his potential. Like, if everything goes well, Garrett Wilson could be a 20-point-per-game guy in PPR. Yeah, I I mean, he's the guy that you really want to figure out how to get onto rosters, whether it's best ball, whether it's that redraft pick where you're kind of at the one-two turn. I think that there are enough options coming back at, say, 201, 202, 203 that – especially if you're only doing one or two leagues, go ahead and take him at the back end of the first round. But right now, in part because, you know, little things kept him from being one of these just massive buzzy guys in the last couple of weeks. It, it's not like it's going to make him inexpensive, but if it pushes him to from 110 to like 202 and you can get one of those other guys in the first round and get him in the second, I mean, then you're talking about potentially having two mid first round talents because there are other guys in the 110 who I think you can make that argument about as well. Yeah, no, I love it. And we're going to dive into a couple more of these wide receivers. But first, I want to take a step back. Let's talk about zero RB. It's something where people try to execute it, but there's no real definition of it. How would you define it if it was something that it was? something you could do in maybe two or three sentences. Is it as simple as filling in the flex before you fill in your running back? Is it simple as I'm pushing RB until XYZ round, depending on how deep my draft is? Or is it a matter of extracting as much value as possible um, and be averse to any single position? Yeah, as the more time has passed, I think I get more and more comfortable just trying to think of it from a big picture perspective and not even worry about the zero RB element as much as being a pure contingency based drafter right from the beginning, as opposed to considering the only contingency based plays being things that happen in the double digit rounds. I think for me, that is the part of the insight that allows me to draft well. But if you're looking at the elements of you know, why I drafted a ton of teams in high stakes that way from, say, 2008 to 2013 and felt comfortable writing about it then and saying, look, this is going to work, even if people are uncomfortable with it or feel like there are, you know, logical and evidence-based reasons that it won't. And I'm not saying that there aren't some good counter arguments. There certainly are some contexts in which you, you know, want to be careful, or at least you want to know what the trade-offs are. So many of the antagonistic articles I think are very good because it helps people understand the trade-offs but the elements for me would be this wide receiver scoring advantage that has existed and I would say doesn't necessarily exist in 2023 and so that's something to keep in mind when you're building your teams now and then the flex dominance so if you're in a format and some of the leagues that I drafted at that point you have a two three one format right so you have to play at least three receivers. You're going to have that additional flex because of the wide receiver scoring advantage. That flex needs to be a receiver. It's a two running back, four wide receiver. And then to build through that, if you dominate the receiver position, if you dominate the flex, and then you have this contingency based upside for your running back picks, you end up with these super lineups that are very, very difficult to compete with. Again, I think there are some differences in 2023 that we want to be aware of as it relates to that. And then just that third thing is the chaos. Right. And you think about anti-fragile or if you want to think about it, you know, with different terms or what have you. But it's this extreme contingency based upside for running back plays and the way that running back is really a weekly position, much more than wide receiver is. And that in redraft, very clearly, you can add those guys or if you're in deep leagues, you have some of those guys stashed. They go in, they score a lot of points. One of the things that was very interesting when Mike Beers, I think, really revolutionized best ball and have his you know best ball suite 
on the site here at Rotoviz is that you see clearly that not only does that work in redraft, where some of the elements are very clear in terms of plugging those Arby's in to start sit, where the start sit decision is actually very easy, but also in best ball, it's the dominant way to play. And now that best ball is so huge, I think that that is actually what's convinced people because the evidence is just so clear and compelling that you need to be wide receiver heavy in these best ball builds. So when one other thing that started to happen where you're seeing, especially this year, where more and more managers are starting out with the zero RB approach, you'll see like a few drafts where, where like three managers attempt this, where sometimes, especially in the NFFC or the FFPC, you might see three managers start, start off four straight wide receivers. Does it lose any edge when multiple managers are doing a very similar strategy? Well, one of the ways that I like to check, or there are a couple of ways. I mean, Dave Caven has a fantastic range of outcomes tool that allows you to work through historical matches from players and see what their ranges have been. And you can use that to calibrate from, especially with veterans, where you have a good sort of base of production there. You think, I mean, this, this is really what the guy is. And you can look at some of those guys who are next to each other in drafts and say, okay, this is the scoring level. And then we have Blair Andrews win the flex tool, which gives you implied point totals by ADP using historical results. So again, you can compare these guys right next to each other and say, how comfortable am I with the scoring? Well, in the past, this wide receiver advantage has been huge. In 2023, it isn't necessarily. And so I think you have to go pick by pick, but that, that goes back to your question of if a bunch of people are doing it. I just participated in the Apex Experts draft and it was so wide receiver heavy that I was lucky enough to have the 101. I take Justin Jefferson, but when it comes back to me, the wide receiver values aren't good. Take a couple, it comes back. I take ETN with JSN. It comes back again, and I take a couple more running backs. So this is a 2-3-1 format where you do need to be good at wide receiver, and I took five running backs in the first seven rounds simply because where I was, and there were other places within the draft that I think selecting receivers and going even zero RB would have been very effective, but where I was, the values weren't just similar at running back. They were screaming. And so, I mean, if we want to apply the same kind of thought process, you know, that we've used for a decade to say wide receiver dominates, I think you have to at least consider that you might be in spots in your drafts this year where running back dominates very clearly. Now, there are going to be some differences there because you know, building out with late receivers and that type of thing is not as effective as building out with late running backs. So it's not purely a matter of flipping it in the new environment. But there are some questions and, and situations that you at least want to think about because, again, it's just it's such a different ADP environment. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you bring that up because I think this year with so much wide receiver enthusiasm, I've had a couple of drafts where it's not necessarily my intention, but I've ended up running back, running back, um, and the the builds have looked pretty good. So I think that this year is the very exciting thing where I think we can build our teams um, in really in any manner we want. But I do think that one very important thing is you want to walk out of the first six rounds feeling strong at the wide receiver position. And that might mean that you have to catch up at the wide receiver position, but it does start to dry up. Um, and I think that that's one thing that we're going to see that a lot of the wide receivers we like taking in like the eighth round and the seventh round as we get to like the Las Vegas drafts for the FFPC and NFFC. I think a lot of these guys are going to get started pushed up into the sixth. We're already starting to see it like Jahan Dotson, his ADP has has corrected uh rapidly and a couple of the other guys like that. But it's a it's a very interesting to kind of take a macro view uh, at zero RB. And what do you think are like the biggest myths, Sean? Because I think there's a lot of like pushback when you start talking about any sort of strategy in fantasy. But what's the biggest kind of zero RB myth? You know, I, I lose track of that a little bit, and it's nice to, you know, not necessarily be on social media and hear all of the different things. But when you when you work through it and you think through these elements of why does it work and why do we want to be contingency based, and then you, I mean, there are lots of hilarious things that people have said over time, including, you know, you, you get these tweets where people are like, zero RB is not real and Sean doesn't even exist. And this is all just a conspiracy where fantasy experts are trying to push 
recreational managers off of the best play in order to win all the money. And so I would say that's a myth. <laughs> but the main thing here is I think it's a mindset and this issue that you can use or this idea that you can use value-based drafting and that the market should dictate what you're going to do. Maybe that would be the takeaway for me because I think that one of the things that we're looking at in 2023 is that people feel like the market is now pushing them to go wide receiver heavy. And I always pushed it back against that when people are like, well, yeah, you can talk about this wide receiver scoring advantage, but the market is forcing us to play it in this other way. I don't think that you should let the market push you around. I mean, if, if that's your argument for doing it now, maybe you actually want to think about a little bit of a contrarian path and take some running backs. And that's not to say either that there aren't lots of big values to understanding the value-based drafting element. Whenever I talk about how there are parts of value-based drafting that don't necessarily work or don't necessarily work for me, because partly what you're trying to do is you're trying to make yourself the best drafter and find the tools that will allow you to be successful. And those aren't the same for everybody. So I don't want it to come out as saying the value-based drafting doesn't work. I'm just trying to introduce some other elements of the thinking or think through how there are some other elements that are key for me. Yeah. And I think that that's, that you really nailed that, Sean. It's a difficult question where it's kind of like we could go in any direction with that. But I think the general takeaway is that most of the strong, very strong, very successful managers in fantasy are able to kind of adjust to new markets and they walk away with their team feeling very dangerous. And I think oftentimes being contrarian and going a kind of against the grain, especially in a very big contest, you don't want to go too wild. But I think approaching in a in a sense that I'm going to build the most dangerous team possible regardless of what you know this ADP market is kind of forcing on me or structural drafting is forcing on me is something we should all take away. And I want to interject one question because when you win the FFPC main event two years in a row, you get to interrupt a show and ask a question. So we have Nick um, Costantino of the Go Bills, uh, the guys who won FFPC main event back-to-back -back years. He wants to know... Where do you think JSN should be drafted right now, Sean? Uh, let's say JSN misses, and again, there's a little bit of question marks with that early buy. Let's say he misses the first four weeks of the season, which I think is a an outcome we would all take. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it isn't there, but especially in redraft, you're put in this uncomfortable position where you almost want the guys or the coaches to be conservative. The very worst thing they can do is put the guys back out when they're not ready, re-injure them, and have the person miss a huge chunk of time or just play at less than 100% for a long period. So, I mean, I think that once you push JSN down into, you know, round six, round seven, then you're starting to be comfortable again. It's going to depend a little bit again on the type of format to where if you can have a hole in your lineup, a hole in your roster or not. If you're building with, say three running backs and six wide receivers in the first nine rounds. So you're going to pass on the elite QB. You're going to pass on the elite tight end. And there are certainly downsides to doing that. But if you have those six receivers, then I think you really want him to be part of that because, I mean, you're drafting with the idea that even if it's a, a two, three, one or a two, two, two format, and you're going with four wide receivers to start, he can be a big part of your roster and not need to be there at the beginning. The thing I always struggle with as I draft you know, very aggressive and risky teams is that, I mean, you do get to a certain point where you have enough overall injury risk embedded in your lineup and you have enough injured guys. I mean, one of the leagues that I've already done that I absolutely love, you know, has built JSN and Traylon Burks and it does have other guys. And so you can weather that storm, but you are starting to get to the edge where, you know, further problems and you get off to a slow start. And we tend to think, you know, we're going to have months at this, but I mean, these are sprints, really. You can't afford to give up too much at the beginning. You need to win right from the get-go. So, I mean, keep drafting him, but be aware of what the construction is because there are certain constructions that make it much more viable than others. Yeah, I took him in the seventh round in an NFFC the other day, um, and then the injury happens like the next day. So that's a I, – I still think like at that price, um, if I can weather the storm – He's going to be a guy that's in my lineup as soon as he's healthy. I believe in what you said earlier in our dynasty question that he could be a kind of guy that is just a target vacuum 
uh, elite talent guy. I wouldn't want to let him slip too much because I'm worried about the first few weeks of the season. Um, but I want to talk about wide receivers now. Okay, let's say we're starting out a draft with, you know, two straight wide receivers. We love the wide receiver market. Who are the wide receivers going in the first round that you don't want to draft in a redraft right now? You know, I don't have a lot of fades in the first couple of rounds. I think that the market has pretty effectively figured out who gives you that elite upside to where you can compete with the running backs, even if the running backs hit. And partly drafters are executing their picks this season as if the running backs are not going to hit, that the running backs are not going to have that extreme upside during the fantasy playoff weeks. I mean, that was always one of the big pushbacks that I granted, I think did have merit in terms of zero RB is that when you look at the fantasy playoffs and these races for the big money that, I mean, historically the guys who could go on a three game run of massive scoring, those are going to be the superstars in most cases. Right. And so, I mean, drafters are not that optimistic about that type of event for 2023, but the other part of it is those guys who are going in the first two rounds, I like, and I think that it's hard to make a mistake. Now, maybe this is just you know the contrarian instinct taking over, but I do think that Stefan Diggs and Devonte Adams are maybe counterintuitively the riskiest guys in that range. Diggs always has a little bit of that stuff. I mean, he's somebody who's been a priority target for Rotoviz from like the first week he stepped on an NFL field, and that's treated us very well. At the prices right now, I mean, I think that he needs to hit and Josh Allen needs to hit, and you're probably better off if you have them both. And I kind of prefer not to burn a pick on QB. So that makes him a little bit of a concern for me. And then Devontae Adams with the things that the Raiders are doing as they morph their offense and you know make it a little bit more of a Josh McDaniels, Jimmy Garoppolo type of system. They bring in some guys who I think are pretty interesting who could siphon off some of the targets. I think that there is a little bit of a concern there. But I mean, one of the reasons that zero RAB has worked is that when you, I mean, historically, because these receivers are pushed down, if you drafted superstars with your first picks, I mean, you actually had a high floor. I mean, that's one of the things that I think people have missed. And But they understand now is the reason they're doing it, was that zero RB is actually a little bit of a safe strategy. Devontae Adams is so good that if you're talking about him being the risky guy in those first couple of rounds, then you're probably feeling pretty good about those early round receivers. Absolutely. I think that's kind of where I'm at, where... Maybe there's a little less unknown upside, and maybe those guys don't feel like wide receiver one overall candidates as much as they possibly did a year ago, but they're still very safe in terms of the volume, in terms of what we know about them. But you, we've talked kind of at length here about Garrett Wilson, and I think anybody who's listened to you or, or I or Billy Muzio at any point in the summer knows that we're very, very enthusiastic about Jalen Waddle at cost. I mean, if, guys, if you get a chance to take Jalen Waddle in the middle of the second round, just do it. You don't need to overthink it. He's an elite talent uh, with a ton of upside in a very consolidated offense. But what, there's a couple players I want to you know, get your opinion on at cost, Sean. Amon Ross St. Brown's a guy that I've been pounding the table for kind of all summer long. I think he could have a, an elite target total. Um, I very much believe in his talent. He's still very young. And he looks like the focal point of what should be an offense that puts up a lot of points. But a couple months ago, you were able to get him in the second round. Now you're starting to see him live in the first round. And three times, I believe, in the NFFC primetime, which has only started uh, maybe about 10 days ago, he's gone at the 105. So he seems to be the kind of the, the summer steam guy right now. Where are you at on Amon Ross St. Brown? Where would be the highest level you would be comfortable selecting him? Yeah, so you pull up our Stealing Signals tool, which obviously named after Ben Gretsch's fantastic newsletter. And we have the Sports Info Solution numbers in there. I mean, he ties with Tyreek Hill and Cooper Cup in terms of targets per route last season, which especially when you consider that he spent a decent amount of that season limited. I mean, you're talking about a guy who commands targets you know, almost like nobody else. And the offense is going to be dynamic. Jared Goff is going to play reasonably well. The Jamison Williams thing probably, you know, frees him up to continue at a pretty high 
volume level. I think that Sam Laporte is going to come in right away and be a big part of the offense. I think that Gibbs is going to just have a huge, you know, running back receiving share. So you do have some other guys. It's not like it's going to be just him. But I think with Amon Ra, it's almost like you get this kind of Cooper Cupish play without having to take a risk on a guy who is older and has had some injuries. And now, you know, it seems weird to say, although it was very clear last season, but, you know, perhaps the Lions are just a much more dynamic offense than the Rams with Matthew Stafford at this point. So you get a lot of the upside. Maybe you take some of the risk out of it. I don't have that big a concern about taking Amon Ra in the first round because mostly where I think you should be considering him is going to be an area where you have like six or seven guys who are similar enough that if you have to take him in the first round, you're also going to get one of those values in the early second to where your wide receiver, wide receiver start is dynamic regardless of the exact names. One other player who I've taken um, at usually at the, the one, two turn, I felt, you know, very happy to take him there. Uh, occasionally a little bit earlier is AJ Brown. And one, uh, I heard you and Ben on your guys, very, very, very uh, great podcast, stealing bananas, which I enjoy listening to. You guys brought one thing up that, you know, we've talked about how he's moved up from last year. You know, you were seeing him drafted at the two, three turn. Now you're seeing him drafted inside of the first round. Where are you at with AJ Brown in terms of like how dangerous he makes your build? Is it the fact that there's another kind of elite target earner and Devonta Smith on the same team? Do you think he's got a certain, certain capped upside uh, in terms of targets, where are you at on AJ Brown? Is he the, the player that you want to, you know, take at the end of the first round, or do you want to push him behind the Garrett Wilsons and Jalen Waddles? That one is so tough because unlike Diggs and Adams, where I think you're starting to get into this range where, I mean, there are just, there's some very mild concerns with AJ Brown. I mean, he's probably the best receiver in the nfl you know maybe not named justin jefferson and so you know with him that you're going to get an extremely high target generation ability he's gonna be one of the top guys in targets per route and then his yards per target right that element of what you do in terms of getting some air yard depth making the catch running after the catch when you're talking about a guy who brings every element there the efficiency levels and you can throw in the touchdowns which also matter and when people fade you know, tend to make yourself worse at fantasy instead of better. That whole package is there. And so anybody who wants to take AJ Brown really at any price, I have no problem with. I do think that perhaps you're going to be better off getting, taking a little bit more risk from maybe a wide. I mean, the thing with Brown is he's just going to be so efficient that it neutralizes pretty much all the volume concerns. But if you hit on a guy in that same range that managed to play at a similar level, which is going to be so difficult because AJ Brown is that good, then that player in all likelihood also has the shot to be in an offense where they just, the pie in the passing game is bigger. And so the problem with AJ Brown is that you can hit and still some other people in the same area, maybe hit bigger, but I mean, that's just really splitting hairs when you talk about how good he is. Yeah. I mean, he's a stud. You bring up the touchdowns and, and sometimes this time of year, you know, we want to talk about all these metrics, but at the end of the day, if we had to, to bet on which wide receiver has the most multiple touchdown weeks of the season, AJ Brown would probably be a, a great answer for that. And it's a big driver of fantasy scoring and AJ Brown, uh, definitely don't fade him guys, but it becomes a kind of pulling hair out hairs out to try to, you know, pick which of these guys you like. Cause like you said, uh, there's so many strong options, uh, in the first and second round. We don't need to spend a lot of time on Chris Olave. Uh, yes or no. Are you comfortable taking him at the back half of the second? Yeah, he's not a priority target for me, but I like taking him there. I think if you just kind of take him when he falls to you, when you're in that spot, you end up with about the right exposure. Yeah, so we're we're there with you. I think that back half of the second, I'm fine with him. Uh, I wouldn't want to push him up towards you know these other guys we talked about, but he's like a a player that I feel very strongly about with some unknown upside. Then we get to the third round, Sean, and then this becomes a conversation. The third round wide receivers: T. Higgins, Calvin Ridley, DK Metcalf, who's ticking up slightly with the with the JSN news, 
And then Keenan Allen, who the media reports out of Los Angeles are Keenan Allen looks as good as he ever has. And this Los Angeles offense is humming. Those four guys are kind of living in this, you know, upper half of the, of the third round, which of these intrigues you the most? Well, Keenan Allen has been the guy I've been targeting. He, he looked undervalued. I mean, he had the injury situation last year, but until then he had gone on a very nice stretch of being healthy and just scoring huge numbers of points. One of the things that I think that you can do with veteran receivers is that it's just, I mean, it, it sounds overly simplistic, but with the veteran receivers, the you know buy low, sell high element is really pretty clear cut to where if you just fade the people who have been pushed up on their recent season's performance and then buy the guys who are sliding a little bit, and you're going to want to work through some of their things. You're going to work through the target competition. You know, one of the players who is just very interesting is Chris Godwin, who's coming off of the season where he was very clearly not 100%, still performed well. Now you have the quarterback change, and people are moving him, and then especially Mike Evans way down because of the quarterback change. Well, Tom Brady didn't play that well last year. The – total number of passes that Tampa Bay will have to throw to be remotely competitive is still going to be very high. And unlike a lot of the other guys, unlike a DK Metcalf, unlike a Calvin Ridley, I mean, where are the other targets going to go besides those two players where with Metcalf, I mean, he could end up as the number three guy in that passing game and you're going to take him in the third round. Now he's a huge talent. He's a, a monster person and athlete, but if you could very easily be the third guy, then early third round is not the place to buy him. I mean, Calvin Ridley is probably more likely to be the one than DK Metcalf is to be the one, but you've got three other guys there. And so, I mean, he would really need to consolidate as the top player, which I mean, the history of guys coming off of a situation that's vaguely similar to his has not been that good. Now, I think that, I mean, one of the reasons he's so expensive now is he's had a fantastic camp. And I think the fantastic camp does mitigate most of those concerns, but I mean, until you're out there on the field, I mean, you think about the guy who had had a terrible previous season and supposedly had a fantastic camp last year. And, you know, one of the questions I get asked sometimes that is always sort of fun to answer because you can just admit what you're, what you're scared of is like, what's the player that, you know, you're most worried you're wrong on. And last year, you know, I told everybody don't draft Allen Robinson, right? Don't draft an old guy who's coming off of a terrible season. And then he has this supposedly great camp. And I'm like, this is the person I think you shouldn't draft, but it's also the one I'm most scared to be wrong on. I don't think we're going to get a similar thing with Calvin Ridley. But when you've got Christian Kirk and you've got Zay Jones and you've got Evan Ingram there, I mean, if you're that confident in Calvin Ridley, then you probably, what you really want is you want a lot of Trevor Lawrence. I think that's that's the right takeaway. And you're seeing some very sharp people you know, taking Trevor Lawrence pretty much every single draft now. Um, I love that takeaway. The Metcalf uh, concerns I share, uh, it just feels a little bit rich. I mean, the last last year, the guy had 140 targets, the most he's ever had. And his still, his overall scoring, um, you know, just doesn't quite get there. The previous two seasons, he had double-digit touchdowns, and the overall scoring doesn't quite get there. And now you have a target vacuum like JSN at some point in the season. So that's a very interesting – now I think this debate becomes – even more interesting because I had Jerry Judy included in this question, Debo Samuel versus Christian Watson. The, uh, these two guys are going close enough that this is going to be a conversation. Uh, let's call them both early fourth round wide receivers. Well, Connor O'Driscoll had a fantastic article for us talking about some of these guys who might still even be undervalued and what are some metrics that might help you find some undervalued guys. He was talking about weighted targets per route and, I mean, Christian Watson's weighted targets per route run are pretty crazy. And so you look at that and you think about this kind of natural jump that we have. And it seems like every other article I write, I reference Blair Andrews' fantastic work on these guys making the second year leap and how even if you feel like you're being aggressive with second year players, it's hard to actually push them up to the point where you're not still either. I'm, I don't know if getting good values is exactly the way to put it, but kind of stacking a lineup together to where you now have an overall build with players who could the next year be in the first and second round who give you this ability to maneuver within the pieces that you have and have a super lineup at the end. So, I mean, there's a lot of me that thinks that that's fairly straightforward. At the same time, you do have some quarterback concerns and I mean, Jordan Love has played well in the preseason. He played well in the preseason last year. There, 
maybe are some more skeptical reports from camp about how he's actually looked. And then for me, the player who is just so interesting because he allows you to do something tactically that is important, which is to have a guy still there for you at the end of the wide receiver window. So even though Watson's numbers are just so much better than Romeo Dobbs were because Dobbs also is having a fantastic camp for the second straight time is look good in preseason and gives you an option at the end of the wide receiver window, then that's the way I tend to play it. And if there's risk in an offense, like they think there is with the Packers, then one of the ways that you can both still have some exposure, but manage your risk a little bit is to take the second guy. Now, in most of those cases, we're talking about players who, for whatever reason, and usually it's just the risk that is perceived, but players who are pretty close together in talent. I do think there's an argument that Watson's talent is enough greater that this would be a situation where you actually just want to take the expensive guy. So Watson is just very difficult for me. I, I think that he's a player that the range of outcomes are so, so wide that people who say he's going to hit and be the league winner completely understand people who have almost zero exposure completely understand that as well. I mean, Devo Samuel is one of the best players in football. And so I mean, really your main concern there is just the same kind of concern you have with AJ Brown, which is that, is there enough total in that offense to support all those guys? And if there isn't, wouldn't you just prefer the cheaper pieces? And so that's where Brandon Ayuk becomes very interesting. I want so many of these guys, Sean. And, you know, the Christian Watson you bring up, I, I one way I've liked to play it, and I'm curious your, your thoughts on this strategy, is when I take Christian Watson, I like to take either Romeo Dubs, and it's harder to do this now, but before Romeo Dubs', Dubs ADP was, was quite low, um, and now it's adjusted where it's, you know, 10th, 11th round, it's a lot harder. But I've also liked to take some some Jaden Reed. So in a 20 roster league, I will take Christian Watson and I will have somewhat of a hedge. Or if you're a optimist, a double bet that the offense will will beat expectations. Your thoughts on, on that strategy? Because I think there's a little bit of an argument that if Watson misses, Romeo Dubs or Jaden Reed hits. Or could it be a complete mess where none of them hit? Yeah, I guess I would prefer to have it with that type of offense to have it a little bit more spread. But certainly in best ball, I think you can do that. I think if you like the secondary pieces and are comfortable having a couple guys, then you start to get into that situation where Jordan Love becomes really interesting. Because again, we're trying to figure out like how do we get QB scoring without having to pay for it. And so You already answered it, Sean. It's Sam Howell. There you go. There, there you go. go. There you go. You don't have to worry about Jordan Love, guys, because Sean gave you Sam Howell. Um, but yeah, Jordan Love, I, mean, I agree with you, Sean. It's like, it's so tilting. Um, I think we'll know really, really quickly what this Packers look offense looks like when we get to the real games. Um, and I don't know. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be very, very exciting. Want to quickly, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Brandon Ayuk. Who is your favorite wide receivers when we start getting to rounds five through seven? And really, Sean, this is going to be rounds five through six and within a couple of days, if not a couple of hours, based on with these wide receiver injuries. Jahan Dotson, uh, Terry McLaurin with a little bit of a turf toe injury, Brandon Ayuk, Christian Kirk, George Pickens, and Tyler Lockett. You'd already mentioned that you're intrigued by Chris Godwin. He was included in this question. You can You can choose to talk about him or some of these other guys. Well, Dotson and Pickens, I think, bring a variety of ways for you to win. And the only reason that they're available in this range is that they had some warts in terms of their profiles, A, coming in, which does is still relevant in year two. And then B, in some of the trendiest metrics, they are okay, as opposed to like breakout star types of players. Now, Blair has written a variety of fantastical art, fantastic articles on this. And one of the things that I really like about the way that he writes and what he looks at is, you know, what metrics are predicting ADP and what metrics are helping you beat ADP. And not surprisingly, some of the things that are trendier are, are going to actually, you know, put you more in that ADP mode as opposed to beating ADP. And if you feel like the market is relatively accurate on Dotson and Pickens, then there are some things to their profile 
and we kind of get back again to the, some of the scoring ability and the big play ability and the fantasy over ex, fantasy points over expectation ability where I mean, they probably set up nicely to beat that. And if those elements in terms of yards per route, targets per route, those types of things tick up a little bit, if they're able to make some inroads and for Pickens, it's going to be so difficult because Deontay Johnson is maybe the best wide receiver in the entire NFL at getting open. And that very clearly makes you a target hog. With Dotson, you have Terry McLaurin, and maybe there's a little bit of a, a window opening up here with the injury, but I guess I would not really be looking at it purely from that perspective. Or I mean, if you don't like Dotson before, you shouldn't like him just because he's going to have maybe a little bit more opportunity the first couple of weeks. I mean, if you're on him, you should be on him because you think he's got this breakout potential. So those two guys, I think they're fun picks, which is always nice. But if you had people really hit from that range, those two second year guys, I think, are probably the names that give you a real shot for production where next year you're thinking, okay, well, you know, do I draft? It's kind of that Amon Ra, you know, Garrett Wilson question. Like, who do we draft at the 111 versus the 201? I mean, if you're getting that kind of question next year at this time, then you know both of those guys had a very good season. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. I do like Brandon Ayuk a, a, a great deal. And I think those second year guys are extremely intriguing. But Sean, we, we, we could talk wide receivers for, I could, literally sit here talking wide receivers with you for like three hours but i want to dive into the running back position because you every summer it's a it's appointment reading um you drop your zero rb targets and i think that this is a um actionable article for anyone whether you draft with a hero rb or zero rb strategy um this is a great late round um and mid round rb target guide i wrote one at player profiler i had a zero and hero RB targets that I wrote a couple weeks ago. And I made sure I, I emailed this to Sean with a little note saying that, you know, you somewhat influenced me to write this. And I was very happy because on your picture on, on article number one, you dropped players 15 through 11. The player, you, one player you had on there was a guy I had on my list, which was Chuba Hubbard. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Chuba and then talk about some of your previous hits in this article, Sean, because it's, it's quite impressive. Well, that's that's kind of you to say, and it it's always a lot of fun to go through the hits because as you're writing it and as you're drafting these guys, it does feel risky, and so it's a good reminder that the types of profiles that we go after do tend to hit. So, looking back to the previous articles, I think there are six top five running backs. Who Austin Eckler. Featured. Austin Eckler was a few years back. You had him, and Jamal Charles was the big one. Or what is it? Remind me the RB top five ones. Well, Jamal Charles was a big part of that 2013 season that was so good for me. That was actually before the list. But the 2015 one featured the number one overall RB in Devontae Freeman. In 2017, you had two top guy, five guys in Kareem Hunt and Alvin Kamara. You mentioned Eckler. Uh, 2021, James Conner was number four overall in win rate. So, I mean, there have been a lot of really fun plays and – and Melvin Gordon, somebody who I think, you know, has gone through all of these different iterations in terms of what he is, where he was a bust, and then he was on the 2016 list, ends up as running back five when, I mean, people forget just how inexpensive he was, despite coming in as the, an amazing, amazing prospect. Then you go in your rookie year and don't score, and people sell. And so then you get that type of player. Now, fantasy is evolved a lot since then you don't get those types of really clear values but you think about someone like a melvin gordon who you know then he goes and has in the situation austin eckler you know now he's someone who is just looked at with sort of disdain again because any type of running back fails then i mean they they go from from hero to zero so that kind of direction very quickly but it's interesting to kind of look back through those names and i do think now we have to be even better in terms of the evaluation to find these types of guys. The article comes out in three pieces, which is nice because it is spiraling for me a little bit in terms of the number of words spilled for each player. I, I just had so much fun the last couple of days writing about this. You mentioned Chuba, and one of the things that will happen that I try to embrace as opposed to resist is just that some of the guys are going to be kind of pet players. And you look back at him, you look back at what he was as a college guy. And I think that some you know, listeners are going to be like, well, that stuff is completely irrelevant. It happened a long time ago. But when you're thinking about this 2019 season 
where I mean, you've got like epic, epic performances from Jonathan Taylor, J.K. Dobbins, Travis Etienne. Obviously, we know those three players are very relevant in the early rounds of fantasy football. Hubbard was better. I say better. I mean, he was more productive, which isn't quite the same thing. But you have this guy with, you know, borderline. At one point, it was supposedly borderline Olympic speed. I don't think that that's the case now. He didn't necessarily test that well coming out. He had some injuries his final year in college. And then uh, the real thing that happens was his rookie season, Christian McCaffrey has some injuries. Hubbard plays a lot and plays really poorly. And so that's the thing that you want to make sure you do is you've established your baseline. You're well calibrated on what the guy has done. And you're not just throwing these things away. You're not ignoring them. But Hubbard came back last season and had a profile where his before contact is after contact and his broken tackle percentage. And I like to look at these three things kind of together as opposed to in isolation to really understand what the running back does. A lot of people will just completely throw out the before contact element. But if you're going to try and figure out a guy, and this is one of the things we talk about in terms of how do you win leagues, right? And is relevant, especially in the first three or four rounds. If you want to win your league, you need to draft a guy with workload who can also beat that workload, right? So if you are drafting and you're completely fading efficiency, you're not drafting the kind of player who could have you know three or four fantasy points over expectation and actually get you into that 25, 26 point per game type of season. If you want to do that, one of the things you need to be able to do is run through the line and then run to daylight. I mean, if you've got to break 15 tackles at the line of scrimmage in order to gain that first yard, and then you're going to thrash for a couple more, it looks great to everyone. And the coaches love it because sports are about physical dominance and football is definitely about physical dominance. So you do that and people like it, but does it turn into yards? And so that's always kind of the question there. You put those pieces together and you have a guy with explosive ability and he demonstrated that last season against the detroit lions really you know wrecked their playoff bid by breaking out for multiple huge runs but you look at him and you look at it to miles sanders one of the things we're looking to do with the zero rb list is to find some discount options to find some ways to play the little edges where maybe the backup and the starter are closer together than people think. Well, the profiles for those two guys last season are actually very similar. Now, one of them is a big money free agent signing. The other one is this guy who's a backup that people you know, have this perception of being a very limited talent. But we have reasons to believe the talent probably isn't that different. And so if you have that environment, one of the things too, the, our advanced team stats tool will show you a lot of the blocking numbers that these teams generated. I don't think it comes as a surprise to anybody that the Eagles blocking numbers were a lot better than the Panthers blocking numbers. So if you want to throw that into the profiles as well, when we look at Miles Sanders versus Chuba Hubbard, I mean, maybe Hubbard is better. I don't expect people to buy that. I don't think the coaches believe it. Certainly if they thought that that was a possibility, you probably don't have that free agent signing. So I'm not saying that suddenly like Hubbard's going to go out there and be the starter. If anything, he seems like he's in kind of a battle to be the backup, right? So we always want to keep that in mind too. I mean, he's, he's battling for those second string snaps, but here's a guy who probably is more talented than people realize. And I guess I have some concerns about the overall offense. Most of the guys I'm drafting are in offenses where I think that could be to their benefit. But Hubbard is just a guy who is a lot of fun. I think illustrates a lot of the elements that we're looking for when we're talking about zero RB candidates. No, I like it. And, and he's a guy that I've drafted as well. Um, definitely an interesting player. Give us one more guy for the first class fantasy audience. That's going to be showing up on your list, Sean, what, um, you know, right here on article number two, which is dropping any moment now. Well, last year over the final four weeks of the season, and that does include week 18, which obviously nobody's really playing, but Tyler Algier was the running back five. And if you're anything like me, the Falcon season was distressing enough that you're probably not paying a ton of attention then, but I mean, he looked really good, right? So we think about that. He comes in and he's just the ninth rookie running back this century to put up a thousand yards after being drafted outside the top 100 picks. Now you would have had some other guys who would do it if you have that additional week. So he's, he's operating with an extra game than a lot of players, but it, regardless of how you look at that, it is impressive where he was drafted, what he came out and did. But then the other thing is you have three backs last season who carried the ball at least 200 times and yet managed both three plus yards after contact per attempt and a 20% plus evasion rate. So evasion rate would be the combination of broken tackles and forced missed tackles 
both of which are very relevant when you're thinking about what a running back does to generate yards on his own. Those three guys, Josh Jacobs, who is obviously the sensation, Aaron Jones, who is a little bit, I'm, I don't, I haven't drafted any Aaron Jones. So I'm not saying like people are weird for not drafting him. I think maybe I'm weird for not drafting him. I don't understand his ADP, right? You mentioned like, how do you play the Packers? It's like, well, if Jordan Love is going to have any passing success, Aaron Jones ADP makes no sense because the only reason to be betting against him would be that that offense is a train wreck. So you've got two really high end guys and then you have Tyler Algier. So we work through it. Obviously Bijan is there. Obviously Bijan is drafted in the first round and looks like a superstar, young generational prospect, but Algier has some standalone value. And it's almost a thing where it's kind of depressing because I have a lot of Bijan and I'm really excited to watch him play at the NFL level. But what you hear out of Atlanta is that Algier is going to play a lot. And so if anything, we probably have more concerns about Bijan's ADP than we do for Algier. Yeah, it's uh, Billy Muzio's talked up Tyler Algier. I've, I have made sure and grabbed every single Tyler Algier share that I can, especially on my Bijan Robinson dynasty teams. It's kind of a funny thing, Sean. I, I flipped a bunch of Tyler Algier shares after the season last year in dynasty. And then I went back and, and picked them up after I got my Bijan's. But in, in redraft, he's definitely super interesting because... You know, if they do stay as run heavy as they have been in the past, or if they're using Bijan Robinson as sort of a weapon out of the backfield and not in a traditional sense, uh, then I think Tyler Algier is going to be a safe 10 to 12 carry a game guy, despite, uh, you know, the presence of Bijan Robinson. So, you know, a guy goes over a thousand yards as a rookie. Um, that's a very good track record of success um, in terms of the guys that have done that. You're talking about, you, we can, it, it's probably about six, seven guys currently in the league. And then a few more when you started talking about Kareem Hunt and Leonard Fournette that ran for a thousand yards as a rookie uh, and Algier is one of them. So he's definitely an interesting handcuff plus type guy. I think he could end up being, have a little more volume um, than some people think. So Tyler Algier, Algier and Chuba Hubbard both appear on this list and you can go and get this list. If you sign up for Rotoviz, Sean's dropping Part one, which is like the one everybody's excited about, Sean, because you drop players five through one. That's maybe this weekend. Well, the plan, which I have successfully executed so far, was to go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so that our subscribers have the full list when they start drafting Friday night. Obviously, we know draft people are drafting all the time, but huge number of home leagues drafted this weekend want everybody to have those names when you're doing your most important league. No, that I, I think that's great. And definitely check out my article on playerprofiler.com and definitely check out Sean's at, at Rotoviz. One running back I want to pick your brain on that I've been very high on, as has Billy, and I've heard you talk about him on podcasts throughout the summer, is James Cook. We love James Cook when he was going in the eighth round. Now James Cook, we're starting to see creep up into the fifth in some of these you know high stakes drafts. Do you think that he's reaching a, a certain level where he's not going to return as much value or are you still extremely intrigued by James Cook um, and kind of the potential he brings to the table for Buffalo? I like him. I like him. I think that it really didn't make sense for him not to be up there to start with. It does make it a little bit trickier because I mean, one of the things this year that is both fun and you know very difficult in terms of figuring out how you want to play these drafts is that five, six, seven, I mean, those rounds are a lot of fun rounds three and four, especially at wide receiver. If you're trying to do a zero RB type of build are gross. And so then your question is like, how much humility is appropriate? Because one of the things we know is that having a lot of ADP value on your team is generally good. And yet being generally good, maybe doesn't answer the question of how you should draft in any particular league. I mean, it's very tempting to draft guys from rounds five, six, and seven in rounds three and four, just so you get a little bit more excitement and upside in those rounds. So we have, and, and I say that to kind of set the stage for this answer on cook, which is that, you know, in five, six, and seven, there are a lot of great names. And so when you're on the clock, it's going to be a tough decision. I do think as some of these guys rise that one of the things you want to be careful about is getting off of a player you really like just because of a minor change where now you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm not going to get like this amazing value, so I don't want it. And so you think of some of the guys last year that, I mean, I think about Ramondre Stevenson last year, who I didn't draft as much as he went up. Certainly Tony Pollard went up. The one that I regret the most 
and I think is at least somewhat relevant to this question, not to say that James Cook is going to do this, but the year that Arian Foster destroyed all of fantasy, there was this time period where he's creeping up from six to five to four. And I can remember like this move from like six to five where I'm like, ah, I mean, do I, do I really want him at that point? Because now he's starting to get into this range where running backs tend to be. And this was before, you know, Ben had done such a nice job of discussing a lot of things with the dead zone, but you're looking at this and you're saying, I mean, these are the profiles. These are the ranges where running backs tend to be awful, awful. Right. And so you're like, if he's going to, if he's going to move up into that range, then I just, I'll just pick a different position. I'll stay, you know, very determined with the zero RB. Like, so you passed on Arian Foster because he moved up like another six, seven spots. Like this guy <laughs> was the complete and total league winner and everything about that season depended on him. You know, don't be so inflexible that you pass on that guy just because he got a little bit more expensive. Now, having said that, I mean, James Cook has a long way to go to accomplish that sort of a season. And there are lots of other guys in that range. Maybe somebody else in that range is the Arian Foster. And so we want to be careful too. when we're trying to pattern match because we can make a lot of mistakes that way. Sean, you do realize that people tail will stop listening when you said Arian Foster in the same context as James Cook, and you just moved his ADP up. So you added context at the end, but people don't listen to the, do not listen to the context. They just heard James Cook could be this year's Arian Foster. So there you go, Sean. Thanks. He's going to go with like the 410 tonight. Um, So I want to quickly just ask you about Mondre and Brees Hall. You were at an hour and six minutes now. Uh, Where are you comfortable drafting these guys? Give us a range. Yeah, the, the other side of wide, uh, wide receiver being kind of gross in three and four is that, I mean, if you're going to get Travis Etienne and Brees Hall and Ramondre Stevenson, and Stevenson can be in three, obviously, and, and Brees Hall goes on a massively wide range of picks, it's hard to pass on them. And I'm going to kind of take it back to this B. John Robinson conversation where I don't have a ton, but I'm comfortable drafting B. John Robinson in round one, despite the fact that I know the Atlanta Falcons are going to give the ball to Tyler Algier and Tyler Algier right now is almost certainly better than Dalvin cook and Ezekiel Elliott. I mean, maybe Dalvin is still, you know, 90% of what he was. So maybe he's still better because Dalvin cook was awfully, awfully good. Ezekiel Elliott clearly not as good as Tyler Algier. So you're looking at that and you're saying, I mean, how much better than Ramondre Stevenson and Brees Hall would Bijan Robinson have to be to justify a pick in the 106 to 112 range and for Ramondre Stevenson and Brees Hall to not justify a pick in rounds three and four. Now, maybe, I mean, maybe he's better. He's probably better. I mean, better than Brees Hall completely healthy. Probably not, yeah. but we just, we don't have a lot of insight really. I mean, we know that Brees Hall has put up some supposedly fantastic times in practice we know that he's probably going to play the season and probably play reasonably well, but we don't really know how close he is to hundred percent. And so since you don't know that, I mean, maybe Bijan Robinson is that much better than those guys to where it is a very different calculation, but I think it's weird because it seems like in one case, people don't care. In the other case, people are terrified. Probably somewhere in the middle makes sense. Yeah. And why take those guys when you could take Jameer Gibbs in the third round, right, Sean? Gibbs is an awfully nice pick. Gibbs is an awfully nice pick right now. Um, we were we were getting up there in time, but I want to quickly ask about give us a couple of tight end targets. And before you give us your tight end targets, Kyle Pitts has fallen lately. You know, you're starting to see him go in the end of the fifth round in FFPC main events. I got him in this like the 605 uh this week. And uh I finally reached a point where I said I have to take Pitts at this at this level. Where are you at on Kyle Pitts? I think it's a little bit polarizing right now. Are you in or out at this price? It's tricky because especially depending on your format, you can get to a spot where you really want an elite tight end because you know what that does. And if you're just playing in a 12-team league, then I probably worry about it a little bit less. If you have any hope to win a big tournament, you're probably going to need that tight end to come through and score a bunch of points 
you may not be in the spot to draft a Travis Kelsey or a Mark Andrews. And if you're not, then suddenly you, there aren't that many names. And one of the things with running back and wide receiver is that, yeah, maybe there are a couple of rounds that are, that are thin, but there are always names either in that round or future rounds. But when we're basically then talking about Darren Waller, George Kittle, you know, you're looking at Dallas Goddard, you're looking at Pitts. The Hawkinson one is weird because Hawkinson is somebody that I've talked up for years and yet, I guess, especially if he won't practice, then, you know, yeah, the, his, his price, I think, is tricky, too. I mean, so where else are you going to go if you don't want Kyle Pitts? And I say that as someone who liked him a lot last year and was burned on that. And so then you're battling also the psychological aspect of it, where there's one half of your brain saying, don't be wrong on this again. And the other half is saying, like, if he actually does this year what he did last year and you don't have him in round six... <laughs> will you ever forgive yourself and you're trying to balance those two things which are both very difficult psychologically and i think we can kind of understate the role that emotion plays as we're trying to work through our boards and work through our picks but even if you take that emotion completely out you start to look at the tactics there and like what else are you going to really do you don't have that many options and i mean kyle pitts unless he's jacked up which hopefully he's not unless there is an injury thing lingering there where he's going to play this season at 80%, I mean, Kyle Pitts is just simply too good to not pick in that range. Yeah, and we've already seen a thousand-yard season, which is very difficult for a tight end, and we've already seen a season where he goes north of, of 90 targets, which is a very hard thing for a tight end. So we've already seen this sort of thing. Um, it comes to a point for me where it's not a huge leap of faith that he goes back to his production from – two two seasons ago so i'm i'm in on him at that cost and you know a year ago sean i would be asking you are you in or out of kyle pitts at like the one two turn this is a, a part of your draft where if you miss on your sixth round selection you're you're not done by any means in in any draft as long as you draft well the rest of the way uh dalton kincaid and sam laporta two rookie tight ends in or out um on and redraft and kincaid is steamed up we're starting to see him, you know, in the seventh round in some of these main events. Uh, Laporta has also moved up, but into a range where it's somewhat affordable, like the 11th round. Yeah, Laporta is my second highest exposure player on underdog. So I'm both extremely excited about him, but also very nervous. <laughs> Any of those guys get hurt and you're like, well, there's a big chunk of teams that aren't looking as good. I, the things that you hear about him, I mean, you're really thinking... I mean, this guy is kind of the next George Kittle type of player. Now, whether you get that as a rookie or whether you, you know, the weird thing about Pitts is you got that production as a rookie. And then in the second year, you get this huge disappointment. Just it's more likely that we're disappointed by Kincaid and Laporta this year and they don't move up a ton next year and they <laughs> light the world on fire. And so 2024 is when they are league winners, tournament winners, but especially at the tight end position you do have to play somebody and the most of the cobbled together options are not great now at the very end of drafts i think there are interesting names this year and so i can understand passing on the rookies and just going super late but between goddard and then actually the late round picks i mean you're probably looking at those two rookies as being the most enticing options yeah and we had andrew cooper on first class fantasy with billy and i and i think andrew is one of the sharpest tight end analysts in fantasy and one thing that he talked about kind of resonated is the position is so flat when you get to like tight end 10 in scoring, it's so similar to tight end like 18, 19, there's small edges there. And I think looking for the upside with a player like Laporta or Kincaid, um, those are guys I, I really, really want a ton of. I've been trying to draft both of them as often as possible, whether it's best ball dynasty and now in high stakes drafts as well. Sean, I did not intend to keep you here for an hour and 15 minutes, but this conversation was too good. Uh, everybody, we have a lot of people watching right now. Please smash the like button on YouTube. Sean, let everyone know where they can find you because it's not Twitter, but let everybody know where they can find your written work and your podcasts. Yeah, we, we'd love to have you guys over at rotaviz.com. So much great content going up there every day. And the combination of the 40 plus tools, the dynasty content, which we've had a lot of fun with, especially profiling the RV Triflex tournament over the last couple of weeks, a lot there. Obviously the best ball tools, I mentioned Mike Beers earlier, the best ball tools are fantastic. And then redraft, the zero RB stuff, 
players work, all of that really our biggest emphasis. And this is redraft season. So, so much fun there. Have a great time every week on Stealing Bananas with Ben Gretsch, who I think has one of the most unique and most insightful voices in all of fantasy. Have a great time with Colin Kelly recording Rotoviz Overtime. He brings this amazing perspective recording over there in Ireland. And then, you know, the best ball guru himself. I get to do the best ball banana stand every Wednesday morning with Peter Overset. So, three different shows. Love them all. Love to have you guys over at rotaviz.com. Yeah, and they're all great shows. And a big shout out to Colm Kelly, who contributed to our world famous draft kit. Um, and Blair Andrews, his his written work is definitely appointment reading uh, over at Rotoviz as well. And if you like Rotoviz, I have Curtis Patrick with me on press coverage tomorrow at 1:30 right here um, on Player Profiler YouTube, Player Profiler Twitter. Uh, Curtis is a tremendous analyst. We're going to talk about a lot of things. Redraft. Uh, Sean, this was this was a lot of fun today. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on. And everybody on First Class Fantasy, Billy Muzio and I, we're going to put an extra show this week, FFPC main event show with Billy and I. That's going to drop tomorrow evening. We will post the time uh, on, on social media. I think that's going to drop at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. We drafted it, Sean. We're not doing a live FFPC main event. Uh, we we pre-drafted this one. We didn't want to get sniped. But thanks again to Sean Siegel. Thanks again for everybody watching. And everybody enjoy your evening. Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.